It's time for another episode of the Cultural Hall, and excited in this episode, we're going to learn a lot. Yeah, I should. I knew I was going to make that joke. A lot about Lot Smith, uh, and uh, joining us to tell us all about who Lot was is Talana Hooper. Thank you for being here in the Cultural Hall. Thank you for having me. Now you're going to cue up who Lot Smith is. That's coming, everyone. Hold your horses, as my grandmother always used to say. I want to know a little bit about you, Talana. Uh, t- tell me, uh, tell me where you're from, where you're born and raised, what your interaction with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is. Give me some of that background. Okay, I'm born and raised in the Gila Valley, which is in the southeast corner of Arizona, and um, I. S- been here all my life except for when I went to Arizona State University in Tempe and then when we I married my husband Steve then we he taught school in Fredonia at the top of the state for a year then the rest of my life I've lived right here in central Arizona that's the name of the town where the Gila Valley Temple is we're on the map now (laughs) oh yeah look at that (laughs) Now give me a, give me an idea. When I think Arizona, and when I hear that part of Arizona, like I I think that no one goes outside their house like April to October. Is it that kind of Arizona? No, 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 no. It's nice. It's nice. Sometimes sometimes it snows, but you know, not very often. And yeah. Okay, so so you're in the nice part of Arizona. There are other parts though. You know what I'm referencing, right? Where you're just like no one unless you have to to get to go out for food or water, you are hunkered <laughs> in from April to October because it's just too hot. Oh, no, we are not like that hot valley. No, it it gets warm, but it's it's much better than Phoenix and Mesa. Yes. So you go so you go to uh, Arizona State, which, by the way, I, I felt like there was this little like del- devilish kind of thing with you. I felt that from the beginning. So <laughs> good to have you. So, uh, what did you study there at Arizona State? I actually studied humanities. OK. In a hopes to what? What was the dream back then, Talana? I don't know. I just liked music and art and theater. <laughs> OK, OK. There, and there I only like a there wasn't like a Broadway dream or a you know a no, conductor symphony of this nothing like that. No, and it's kind of crazy because I went to Eastern Arizona College, which is right next door to us right here, um, and I only had one English class, and it was an honors English. But and then I've been writing ever since. Why didn't I have more English classes? <laughs> I did well, have an excellent teacher <laughs> if your education experiences was anything like mine anything that i was forced to do i was immediately not interested in but when i felt like i could rebel or like i was making my own choice that was what i <laughs> continued to pursue and do so maybe that's what it was <laughs> i don't know i don't know i didn't need to graduate so so whatever. you've been you've been writing for a a, a long time uh just on family history, mostly compiling stuff. I just love, I love the history of our family, you know. And you're speaking specifically of your family, the Hooper family? And, well, my mother's and my father's and my husband's family. All of them. I love it all. <laughs> uh, now, now, give me an idea. Uh, drop some names. Obviously, we're going to be chatting a lot about Lot Smith, and I can't, I can't get away from apparently saying a lot about Lot. So I'll try and not make that reference anymore. But, but who are some other, um, maybe? Um, I mean, they're all notable. Every child is favorite. All that kind of stuff. But in in the family history that you've written about, or or studied about, or learned about, are there some notable characters that uh, you want to throw out just real quick? Oh. Ah, right now I'm working on my great grandmother, Sadie Adams Richardson. Oh my goodness. She's crazy. I love it. She's one of my favorite people. I mean, she's there with the outlaws and the Indians and uh, that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. And and my husband had a a grandpa, great, great, great grandpa, Freeman Nickerson. Oh, he was fabulous. I searched him on the internet and he was in people's life histories and everything i loved him he now, was, now, now doing what what was he doing in people's life histories that that seems awfully vague right there freeman <laughs> nickerson which by the way is a great name to yell at someone freeman nickerson <laughs> he 
would, he came, uh, he actually took Joseph Smith on his first mission to Upper Canada. Hmm. Okay. And and then then he's baptizing people in icy water everywhere. And it's like, what? You know, he's like, why cool? And he dies. He doesn't ever come west. He dies there, you know, in winter quarters on the Sheridan River. So mm. Mm. anyway, he's way cool. I mean, they're all, even the black sheep are cool. <laughs> Now, so so pivoting then, because, uh, you know, in the second and third block here of the cultural hall, we're going to get deep into uh, Lot Smith. You've prepared some points and there will be show notes for all this. Some of this will be really historically driven. Some will be uh, really driven by the wait, what <laughs> kind of aspect of of Lot's life. But what what was it that turned you on to Lot Smith? Well, my mother and my father, my grandfather was the last, the 52nd child of Lot Smith. And he was born after Lot was shot, killed. Oh, spoiler, everybody. Apparently Lot gets <laughs> shot. We're going to learn all about that coming up as well. Okay, so the 52nd child, that leads me to believe that this uh, was a polygamous gentleman as well. Yes, yes. And so he just longed to know his father so much. And he would go around and collect stories, anything he could find about his father and it was a passion. And so all his family, all of us, you know, just love Lot Smith. And so my dad and mom were going around collecting too. And then my dad went and died. So that left my mom. And so she was doing research everywhere. And uh, I mean, like for 30, 40, 50 years, you know, Wow. and, uh, so then she was getting old. She was so sharp and uh, good with computers. I mean, before there was a mouse, she could do anything and everything. But then she started getting old. She lived to be 101. Wow. But she couldn't see her computer anymore, you know? And so, and I saw that the story was not going to be told. It was not going to come to publish so before she lost it, before she, well, she could still help me. I said, mom, I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say, and she didn't have anything referenced. And I go, oh, mom, well, where was that? Oh, well, there's a little red book. And it's about <laughs> this big and you, it's in there. So I was able to find <laughs> the sources for all the stuff that she had done. And it was, so I had to put it together and it was just a work of love and Great. It was great. I, I love the uh, the uh, image of you and your 101-year-old mother, and she's saying, <laughs> in the top drawer in the kitchen, there's a little book, rubber bands around it. It's not that one. It's behind it. It's not right. the recipes. Uh, you'll find the, the, the point of reference for that particular thing there. Just keep finding. It's in that drawer, I promise. Okay. Yes. That's it. That's it. So for people who don't know, uh, I mean, I think that most people sort of casually coming into this, we talk about all sorts of things in the cultural hall. They would assume Smith and and obviously assume some sort of relation to Joseph Smith. Put that in context. Okay, there is no relation. Okay. Go, no relation at all. But uh, he knew Joseph Smith. He, w he was actually born in 1830, at the year that the church was born was organized and just like 60 miles away so it was kind of interesting but and his so, family... early, so early interactions with the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints or no yeah well he uh their family joined when lot was about 11 years old and so i think in 1849 does that does that add up no that would be not... 19 yeah i mean yeah 18 18. 18. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're doing math yeah yeah so he was about 11 years old when the family joined the church and okay. they went yeah and so we're going to get in uh talana has prepared a bunch of different points about lot smith and i'm excited to get to know this uh 
one of my favorite things already, just to give you an idea of how much fun Talana is. I asked her for 10 facts and in, in the document she sent me, she's like 10 or more facts about Lot Smith. Uh, so we'll get back. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to dive right into those. We'll do that in the second block of the cultural hall. Here in the second block of the Cultural Hall, remember you can always become a Patreon saint. Go to patreon.com forward slash the Cultural Hall. We call it putting your money where your ears are. You guys, almost 700 episodes of the Cultural Hall. You could start now and three weeks later, constantly listening, have enough content to be able to listen to that. That's that's a lot. That's a, that is that is most of the last decade of my life. Uh, audio available for you to listen to. Uh, and it becomes easier if you're a Patreon saint. Go to patreon.com forward slash the cultural hall. Talana, let's get into Lot Smith. The first point that you uh, you indicate with Lot is gold. <laughs> it's, it's a little vague. Maybe let's get a little bit more into it. Okay, so Lot was in the Mormon battalion. And so he was in California when gold was discovered. And so, according to his son, he didn't pan or dig gold. He just sold supplies and grew vegetables and sold them to the miners. And he made his gold that way. So he. So was he known uh, later in his life to be fairly wealthy? Did was he someone that sort of taken taken advantage of, of those, or just like hey, made a good living selling stuff to the miners? Uh, he got six or seven thousand dollars worth of gold but lost half of it on a on a mule that drowned in the river. <laughs> okay, so there's a little more to that story, I presume. So, well, one moment he lost, you know, half his gold and one good mule. So, but then he came, you know, into Salt Lake and he offered all his gold to Brigham Young. I thought that was astounding. But Brigham Young said, no. Do, why don't you keep a third for yourself, third for your family, and then a third for the church? So, that so, was... so, 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 man, there's a lot of questions that I have around this. So, I wonder, first of all, with the mule slash uh, losing of the gold in that particular river, is there like the legend of Lot's gold somewhere where people are like, he crossed the river here, and this is where the mule, and we found the mule skeleton, but. You know, people don't know what happened to Lot's gold. Is there anything like that? No, I wish I thought about that. Just think how fabulous that would be to find some gold. Uh, and then what was his interaction that he was able to to uh, get face with Brigham Young and say, hey, here, take all my gold. What what was his faith in, in so much that he was like, take it all. I'll take it all. Oh, he all his life, he really wanted to follow the prophet and what the prophet said that's what he wanted to do and any authority over him he was ready and willing to obey no matter what it was <laughs> is, is there any indication as to why that was did he have experiences in his younger years that led him to be so devout because there were a lot of people that were like nah, no thanks i don't know his parents must have been really religious uh, he was actually in a ward with Wilfred Woodruff back in New York. So before they came across the river to Montrose, across from Nauvoo. So that was, I don't know. He's just a good man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, a, was... good, a good man who lost a, a half of his gold to a mule in a river. Just, you know. Yeah. You know. Well, he was passionate about everything that he did. He was passionate. So that maybe explains it. He's passionate about whatever he did. He was all in. And his interaction with the Mormon Battalion, uh, volunteer, or was he sort of drafted into the Mormon Battalion? And then that was a year uh, because we had committed into the Mormon Battalion. And so even though, like, it didn't pan out no pun intended in that joke, uh, for, for the Mormon battalion. Like a lot of them had to stay in California and, and continue to serve their time. Grateful to be done with it. Do we have any indication as to what he felt about that service? He did. He, um, he volunteered. <clears throat> His dad didn't want him to, but hmm. he volunteered and he was, he was young, one of the youngest. 
terrible. For some time, we thought he was the youngest, but he was not the youngest. He was 16. And then he did, in California, he signed up for another stint, you know, a little bit. Then he, then he's, then gold was discovered and, and he went with his friends. A whole <laughs> different kind of thing. So, yeah. uh, so then he travels to Salt Lake, Brigham Young, he says, ah, keep some for yourself, but I will take a third. Thank you. Uh, give me, give me a, a little bit more about this color bearer and Stonewall. I thought this was kind of an interesting fact. Oh, I just, um, he was a color bearer who, with Ephraim Hanks. Now, if people don't know what a color bearer is, what even is that? Okay. So you carry, you ride a beautiful horse and at the front of the parade, carry the flag mm. of all the military parades and and Lot had really good posture. He would sit real straight and every, I mean, this is what, and they loved his steel gray Arabian horse named mm. Stonewall because he was so beautiful and it was just a beautiful sight to see the color bearers come at the, at the beginning of the parade. But he got this horse from Brigham Young and Brigham Young had got this Arabian horse and it could not be controlled at all. And Lot, he was what I call a horse whisperer. He really understood horses. And he said, I would like to be able to, to train this horse. And Brigham Young said, no, no, I don't want you to lose your life. This, this stallion is bad. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I can do it. So he takes him away. And it wasn't long till he came back. And it was amazing how the tr horse trusted Lot. He picked him up by the hind legs, like wheelbarrow fashion, and was climbing all over him and, and doing all these amazing things. And uh, he had trained him so amazingly. And so when Lot left, leaving the horse, the horse followed Lot, and it would not come back. So Brigham Young said, Lot, you've done such a great job on training this horse. I'm going to give you him as a gift <laughs> so i guess he couldn't keep him if he wouldn't stay <laughs> yeah let, let me ask you this so was this uh you know my impression of of some people of this time is that you just sort of did whatever it took right to be able to make it right so he did the battalion because that was an opportunity and it allowed him to go and do that and he was able to make some gold and that allowed him to do that and and then horses he probably uh, with his daily life, just had horses, or was he, you know, a, a horse trainer? I guess by trade, or or just was known for being, as you kind of put it, this horse whisperer of sorts. He was famous as a horseman, and uh, he he brought some horses back with him from California, and he was known for being able to see a good horse. He he knew a good horse when he saw it, and then then he. That his truck, his horses loved him, and he loved his horses. And he was known as a great horseman. And he was here in the Salt Lake Valley, yes. Yes, in Farmington is where he lived. Okay, so technically Davis County. I mean, we like yeah. to keep that very specific, us Salt Lake County folks. No, thank you, Davis County. <laughs> uh, th there, uh, there was a little bit um, of kind of an interesting scandal i don't know about branding his wife and before we go any further i want to i want everyone to know hang on before you start supposing this i just thought that this was an interesting story tell me a little bit about this okay so long after he was dead people thought that he branded his wives in fact when some of them died they they looked at the bodies to make sure that they weren't branded i mean it was some sad. of his wives yes oh, wow okay Yes, I mean, it was amazing, but he never did brand any of, of his wives, but he said one time he got up in church over the pulpit and said, I, everything I possess has my brand on it, including my wife. And so see that I think started the tradition right there when he said that, mm -hmm. you know, and all his friends. His friends were amused because they knew his sense of humor. He was always joking, you know. And uh, but the but the women 
whoa, that was like really bad. So, but anyway, the way his wife, who was branded. Air quotes for those who can't see what she's doing. Yes, air quotes. She said one day, uh, Lot and his friend were out branding and she was going to fix a really nice meal for them. And she needed some more eggs. So she went out to the corral and there was some in the manger where Lot's stallion was. And he, she had been warned by Lot that that stallion only liked him and he had, you know so but she said oh he's over in the corner he's dozing i'll sneak in here and i get, get those eggs there so she got in there oh no the stallion saw her right away that's <laughs> our re started charging her and a lot knew it was not good he jumped and with his branding iron you know she was running through crawling through the fence and he got between got between her and the horse and pushed her through with the branding iron. So his friends were laughing their heads off as one wife had already left him, you know, and says, well, that won't get away from you. She's branded. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's where it started, you know? Yeah, yeah. Give give me an idea. That's a that's a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating little nugget. A, a wife had left him uh, yeah, because- prior, prior to that. Tell me about it. Yeah, because the second wife, she was was bossy. And the first wife was a, kind of a sweet, um, you know, laid back person. And the second wife was a bossy person. And she loved Lot, but she couldn't handle the second wife. If they'd lived in separate homes, it would have been better. <laughs> Give me an idea timeline. When is this in history? This this particular that the first wife sort of left and the and the second wife and let's and, see. Um I would say about 1852 this probably happened. Okay. So we're still relatively new in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh this yeah. is still polygamy still sort of rolling out with some folks. Not everyone is practicing it within the church obviously. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad to hear that he didn't actually brand his wife. That makes me that, that makes me happy to know that it's not the king. Now, uh, tell me a little bit about the the rescue of the Martin Handcart Company. I thought this was kind of, sort of an inter interesting fact about Lot Smith. I was fascinated with this, and just it's and it comes from an 11 year old girl, Nicholas Gourley, and her she married a Teeples. And she was only 11 years old, but she is the one that said Lot Smith and two other men were the first ones who rescued them in the Martin Hancock Company. And they were down there eating bark off the trees. Hmm. And here come these horsemen over, over the hill, and they think they're Indians. It scares them half to death. So, <laughs> But it was, it was Lot, and they had... This was so touching to me. They had crackers in their pocket and gave the children crackers. I thought that was so, that was their food, was their crackers, mm -hmm. and they gave it to the kids. I thought that was so, so sweet, wonderful. When when I put my mind on some of these rescue, um, you know, these rescue missions, I guess is the way to, to, to reference them, that, we, you know, we hear about within the church you know, they they went into the river and the the three men brought them across the river. That is a famous rescue that we hear about, various rescues throughout the time. I think that uh, at least the way that my mind sort of molds these experiences is that um, these individuals were like, we've got everything we need and now we're going to go rescue these people. But these were dangerous, faith-promoting Maybe these people wouldn't make it out alive kind of rescue missions. What any sort of supposition as to why you think Lot would be willing to go do that and be able to help these people out? Well, for one thing, he always had good horses and he was what he was committed. He was passionate. You know, if that was what needed to be done, that is what he did. And he would he was he was all in being able to help out with that that's pretty that's a pretty tremendous um uh, call and uh, i think a lesson let me ask you on a personal aspect with this being a relative of yours and being able to to learn more about lot smith what kind of strength or or, or like um 
what affirming of your testimony? Like what, what have you drawn from learning about lot that affects your personal life now? He, I would say he was fully committed. You know, he made his covenants. He wanted to build up the kingdom of God. He was, and consecration, he consecrated everything. And I think about that often as I go through the temple, you know, the, every time I think of him, you know, I think I need to consecrate like he consecrated, you know, it's, he was a great example. And he was so, he demanded honesty and he wanted all his posterity to know that no deceit can enter the kingdom of God. And he demanded truth all the time. So don't be telling a lie around Mott Smith or you'd be in trouble. <laughs> Is, is, is that something? So uh, I, I think that this sort of interaction with and especially with the ability of some of the things that we have now to be able to learn, study and know about those that have passed on. Is it something that causes a stop thought for you when you're like, well, I could be a little deceitful or maybe I don't have to tell the whole truth. Now, I just looking at you, I can tell that you're an honest and sweet person. So I'm not I'm not putting anything on you. But we all have these times where we're like, man, you know, the easier thing is going to be temptation sort of, yeah sort of telling is is it is it um am i to understand what you're saying is that you actually like in in some of those moments where maybe there's moments of weakness you're like nah not this great 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 granddaughter of lot smith not me somebody else will do it <laughs> yeah i mean i it is it is it is a strength to know about the good points of of your ancestors it, it is a good point and it's good to know their weaknesses because you try, oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and I, I, I'm hoping, uh, as, as a valuable teaching lesson, are we going to get into some of Lot's weaknesses, maybe? Some of those things that you're able to to learn about, grow from, and, and obviously be able to to uh, live your life accordingly, uh, too? Are we going to learn about some of those things as we chat? I don't know. <laughs> he, had a, he had a temper. Because he was so passionate. When he was mad, he was mad. You know, and they say that goes with the red hair, you know. <laughs> Which for people who can't see, as Talana indicates, her red hair. So are you saying, let me uh, let me make sure I'm interpreting this correctly. Are you saying that maybe, Talana, when you get a little mad, everybody knows about it? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't had a real bad temper. My dad had red hair and he said he had to control his temper. But I never saw him hardly mad ever, so he must have done really well. <laughs> but but when he was mad, boy, watch out. Well, when he said to do something, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> that was how we avoided that. That was how we <laughs> were able to keep Dad happy. Uh, let's take another break. When we come back, uh, we've got a few more points about Lot Smith. We're going to make our way through. Plus, uh, there are three questions that we ask everyone who steps into the cultural hall. I'll ask those of you. We'll come back and do that in the third block. <laughs> Here in the third block of the Cultural Hall, remember you can always email us, contact at theculturalhall.com. We'd love to hear your emails, your thoughts on the various episodes, suggestions for future episodes, or just commentary in general. I'm, whatever you want to do. It's just an email address. You get to do the rest. Contact at theculturalhall.com. Now, we've got a bunch of points. Some of these we're going to take uh, a little bit of time with, and others we're going to go pretty quick. Uh it's quite the headline when you say treason. Tell me about Lot Smith and treason. <laughs> so he is most famous for burning the supply wagons of Johnston's army that was going to come and annihilate the Mormons because they had rebelled against the, the country, et cetera, et cetera. And so, but, but there was to be no bloodshed. But so they just kind of hindered him so that they couldn't come into Salt Lake. So... He there was a thousand dollar reward for treason for him because he had burned the supply wagons and a reward for him and then only $150 for the other people. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's a significant amount of money, especially for that time. So my my hope and I am crossing fingers so much that you, we have a picture of Lot Smith on a wanted poster. Do we have that? No. <laughs> oh, somewhere, maybe. 
I like the idea. Give me, give me, um, in, in my mind, I've sort of created Lot Smith to look like a sort of a Porter Rockwell, sort of a rough and tumble man of the plains. Is that, is that, uh, what Lot looks like in most of the pictures that we have of him? I don't know. He has a, a long, he was famous for his long red beard, but he was kind of a little bit, sh uh, kind of baldy on top. So, so I like, don't know. Like most men. <laughs> <laughs> at least nowadays huh okay so not maybe maybe not that rough and tumble what about uh barren rock now when you proposed some points i was like what is barren rock and why why should we care about this tell me a little bit about lot smith and barren rock so um so when brigham young called him to go call, make a colony in northern arizona you know he, that he had a specific place that was at the sunset crossing mm -hmm. and probably that was a specific place because the, the Congress had passed a resolution to have a railroad book right across there. And so that would be a valuable place. And Brigham Young was always looking for valuable places. For, and so that was a specific place that he wanted so when Lot got down there to Arizona, kind of by Winslow, Arizona is where this is. Mm -hmm. Sunsets by Winslow. And so people had been there before, members of the church, and they said, oh, that's a horrible place. And it was a horrible place. They said, you'd be much better if you go over here where there's actually some water and some, some fertile ground, et cetera, et cetera. And... But nope, Lop said, the prophet said, if if he tells us to go settle on a barren rock, that's where we go. So that's so where. They did. So they did. And it was hard. They got flooded out and everything. They had lots of troubles there. But it was turned out to be a very valuable place because people going to settle down in southern arizona used that as a buy station and and the railroad did go by winslow you know so it was good i'm i'm catching a pattern where it's like well it doesn't it doesn't matter too much we know lot's gonna do it no matter how hard or how easy this thing is uh, in fact that's what he said he had sent some people down before and they had come back and he said well i know someone who else will go and stay and it was he said it over the pulpit in a meeting and only one wife was there and she heard it. Oh, he didn't even know he was going to be called, you know. <laughs> I can't even imagine that happening in today's time, you know, and and obviously it it likely wouldn't. But I can't imagine. I mean, we get we panic when we had a state conference a couple of weeks ago when the state president just randomly called on someone to bear their testimony. And that's just bearing of your testimony at state conference, not pick up your family and your several wives and move to a place that people don't want to leave to live. That to me, I mean, it's a it's a different time. It is a different time entirely. Um, and and Lot be, befriended the Indians as part of it, too. I thought the. Uh, the nicknames, especially for Lot, were pretty interesting. Yeah, he the, there were Navajos and Hopis mostly, and his Navajo name was the Gahachi. And his Hopi name was, let me see it again, let's see. It's uh, the Hopis or the Mokis, they were called. Allah so watch me. And they both mean red beard. <laughs> Pretty, pretty on the nose. Uh, what was it? What was his relationship like with the Indians? I know for um, several people in this time, the Native Americans were actually treated pretty well by the church, but then yes. there were also times when when that was not the case. Yeah. Uh, so Brigham Young had specifically told him, "Befriend the Indians. They're the Lamanites. You know, befriend them." So he was always teaching them how to to a farm and he would let them glean in their fields and if anybody said anything about a good the only good indian is a dead indian he said you are dismissed you wow. are released as he was on the indian side and 
one time uh, there was a, a younger Indian that was stolen stealing wheat from a grandma. And let me tell you, he found that out. He didn't like stealing or lying. <laughs> and he got after that Indian. I mean, I think that I think he beat him because he was not having that old woman treated that way, mm. you know. And so he really, he really loved the Indians and the and the Navajo chiefs held him in high esteem, you know. So to to the point that at his passing, I thought that that was sort of unique about about what you write about. So, yeah, ironically, it was a renegade Indian that shot him in the back, and they had actually the Indians were wanting to kill a big Mormon. And they figured he was the biggest Mormon there by Tuba City. Hmm. And they shot him. They, I think they had that planned out. Yeah. But the, the Navajos also uh, mourned his, his death. Yes. Obviously, it was the renegade that that uh, put an end to his life. But several people within the tribe mourned yes. his death. Yes. The Hopis and the Navajos, they knew it was a Navajo. They wailed. They had this wailing when, when they die you know, mm -hmm. real high pitched wailing right there at the house when he died, they were mourning because they loved him, you know, and then the Hopis, they say, anybody asked them, no, they're not Navajo. We're Hopi. We did not kill Lot Smith. We're Hopi, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about the interaction that Lot had with uh, not only Brigham Young and his compass, but also uh, Wilford Woodruff as well. A couple of the, the presence, prophets of the church, and Lot's interaction with them. Yes, that's very interesting. So Wilfred Woodruff, you know, to avoid arrest for polygamy, he came down to the settlements on the Little Colorado. And so one time, he, he always had to be on the lookout for the U.S. Marshals. And so one time, Wilfred Woodruff is speaking in Brigham City, and Lots sitting there with him on the stand, you know, mm -hmm. and two U.S. Marshals come in and they guard the two doors up to the side, you know, and so Lot, he knew exactly what was going on. And so he privily <laughs> arranged for the escape. And so during the closing, you know, Wilfred Woodruff is talking. So during the closing anthem, um, Lot Smith and Brigham Young just walk down the aisle and go out the kitchen door. Yeah. The U.S. Marshals didn't happen to see. And all the people are sitting there. They know the Marshals are there and they go, oh, I can't believe this. They're walking straight out, you know, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. through the congregation. And so when the, when everybody starts going out, the U.S. Marshals are looking all around. They, Where's their man? He's gone. And Lot had a saddle, saddled horses outside, and they ran them. They rode away to the dairy up in the mountains. So it was cool. You know, uh, as I'm looking over uh, the ten or more facts which you prepared <laughs> for our time, I'm recognizing we, we're not going to be able to get to all of it. Uh, I, I'm wondering if maybe there's one that you, as you look over the rest of the stuff, that you would like to share, and then I've got one that, if it's not the one that you would like to share, that I would like to ask you about, and then uh, maybe we get to the three questions that we ask everyone. Is there one of these points that you wish to kind of share with us before we... Wrap oh, the shoes. Up. I think the shoes. Okay, tell me. The shoes. I think because he was in the Mormon battalion and had to go without shoes, he had a fetish for shoes. Okay. I mean, he went one time, he bought 30 pairs of shoes, says, Oh, this would be great for my family, you know. But what touched me was that he would give his shoes to people who really needed them. I mean, he always seemed to have a pair of shoes with him. And he would give them to people who were suffering, you know, one one down on the little on the Colorado River and one down in Mexico when he went down there. The, you know, people were in bad, bad need of shoes and he gave them shoes. And I was always impressed with that. That's a, that's a pretty remarkable, especially for that time, right? When 
you know, hazards, conditions, uh, you know, some times of year, those kind of things could could be the uh, difference between life and death for some folks, for him to give not only the shoes off of his feet in some scenarios, but also just to be able to provide that for people. We think of it maybe in our 21st century eyes and go, yeah, it's just a pair of shoes. What's the big deal? At that time, that it was a much greater sacrifice. It was big. <laughs> Uh, the one that I wanted to 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 ask you about is the teetotaler. Lot Smith being a teetotaler, uh, talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, about that. I thought that was kind of an interesting point. Yeah, he, you know, this is long before the word of wisdom became, you know, mandatory. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, and so the family. Some of us, some of us say that it was he was a teetotaler because he saw his father lying drunken. His father had a tavern, you know, and others say that it was a promise that he made to his mother that he would not drink. And I kind of think it was a combination. Mm -hmm. And so he would never drink and he never drank the coffee. He never smoked. So he was he was all in on the word of wisdom. <laughs> You you mentioned uh, that during his military campaigns, he was sort of confused, uh, con, con, um, not convicted. Uh, he was uh, accused, of, accused being, of being a drinker, a drinker because he had he had a big red nose. <laughs> he goes, no. no. And then the man says, he, he says, I'm not a drinker. And so the man said, well, then take down your sign because and his sign was his big red nose. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, kind of in closing on this, and we will get to the three questions we ask everyone. So, I mean, the, Lot Smith, not a relation to Joseph Smith, at least not, you know, anything of note. Uh, it, it is a story that intersects various times throughout church history, um, not only with Brigham Young and Wilford Woodruff, but many of the players that as they come to the Salt Lake Valley and then the Arizona Valley and, you know, everything like that. What was it that made you decide to... Uh, put this all together in a book and make this widely available for uh, people beyond just your family. Obviously the fa familial connection, people are, you know, Oh, we're interested in who this person that we're connected to is. Um, wh what do you think takes it that extra step that, that you feel like has worth for anyone? He is born in 1830 and he lives through almost every, he, participates in almost every major church history uh, happening throughout his life. Mm -hmm. He's, he goes to the Mormon Battalion, he goes in Salt Lake and Farmington, and in the Echo Canyon War, the War of 1857, and then he's helping the church. He, uh, under Br Abraham Lincoln, you know, guarding the the telegraph lines and the mail during the civil war, you know, and then, then he goes colonizing, you know, and so, and then he goes to Mexico. So, he, so he's, and then he's back to Arizona. So he just covers so much important phases of church history during his life. And, and and what I also love about it is it's a man, as you've pointed out several times in the time that we've talked this morning, uh, a man committed to his faith at whatever costs. And, yes. and, I, and I think that that's um, certainly not a unique thing, but I think any time that we have the opportunity to read, um, study, and focus on someone who has done that and be able, because we have the advantage of where we sit, to see how that impacted his life. I think that that is kind of a, 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 a unique perspective to be able to take that from Lot Smith's life. So I appreciate what you've done for sure, but wanted to put that in context with people who are like, wait, so all we did is a family history lesson about Lot Smith with Talana? Why did you do this interview, Richie? There, that's why, pal, questioning people. Yes. Uh, we have three questions that we ask everybody in the cultural hall, and I'll ask those questions of you. The first question is, is do you have a calling right now? And if so, what is it? I am a temple ordinance worker in the Gila Valley Temple, and I am the ward chorister, and I love it because I love to sing. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Now, let me ask you, do you sing loud and proud from up on the stand? Are you one I, of those choristers? I do. <laughs> Good. Good. See, that's why you studied the humanities back in college is so that one day you could be a ward chorister. I knew it. We just didn't know the connection yet. The second question we ask everyone uh, is if you could pick a calling for yourself, either one that exists or make one up, what would you pick? I would always, my two favorite callings have been primary chorister and uh, primary president and stake young woman president. Those are my favorite. Oh, I, oh, I loved serving so much and teaching, creating, helping people strengthen their testimonies, you know, and that it's, it's, it's wonderful. That's my favorite thing to do. Uh, and then the final question, we ask you to interpret it however you may, but the question remains, what is your favorite part of your faith? Uh, the thing I've been thinking about lately is I am so grateful for a prophet and I'm grateful for the commandments. I am grateful for Jesus Christ. I am grateful for his atonement. I'm just grateful for not being left alone, having guidance and, and having a testimony and knowing my family's forever. <laughs> All of that. Yeah, beautifully said. I, w I do want to throw in one more question for the person who is like, man, if I had this kind of, you know, Lot Smith in my family history, I could go and study right now to the person that, you know, hasn't done any family history, who hasn't looked into some of their past, some of those names that they see on the family tree. What sort of encouragement would you give to those individuals? I think every family is so wonderful. Every single family has stories and we're just lucky if somebody, if somebody has recorded something and, and if, and speaking of pioneers, if you are a member of the church, this pioneer heritage is yours. Also, it doesn't have to be your grandpa or grandma. It is, it is all of our heritage. Yeah. Well, Talana, I hope that this episode has nourished and strengthened your body, that if you're not healthy enough to listen this week, that you'll be healthy enough to listen next week, and that when the time comes, you'll be able to travel home in safety. In the meantime, we'll be saving a seat for you on the back row of the Cultural Hall. <laughs>